In industrial facilities, many operations depend on heating or cooling process fluids. For example, the liquid entering this distillation column is heated to enable the distillation process to occur, while this process liquid is cooled so that it can be properly stored. This heating and cooling is done by transferring heat from one fluid to another in devices like these called heat exchangers. To understand how heat is transferred, it's important to understand what heat is. Heat is a form of energy that's associated with the movement of molecules in a material. This energy can often be measured as temperature. For heat transfer to occur, there must be a difference in temperature. When there is a difference in temperature, heat is transferred from the material with the higher temperature to the material with the lower temperature. Heat can be transferred between materials in three basic ways, by conduction, convection, and radiation. With conduction, heat is transferred as a result of physical contact between two materials, or from one part of an object to another part of the same object. Another form of heat transfer is convection. Convection is the transfer of heat within a moving fluid. Convection can be divided into two categories, natural convection and forced convection. We'll use this container of water and dye to show how natural convection works. As the water is heated, the water that's closest to the bottom is heated more than the water elsewhere. As the temperature of the water on the bottom increases, that water becomes lighter or less dense and rises upward. At the same time, the cooler water sinks to the bottom of the container. So during natural convection, as heat is transferred to the water, the difference in densities causes the water to circulate in the container. This circulation helps to transfer heat throughout the water. During forced convection, Heat transfer occurs when a mechanical device such as a pump or a fan causes the fluid movement. In this process, air is being moved through the heat exchanger by a fan. The third form of heat transfer is radiation. Radiation is the transfer of energy by electromagnetic waves. Microwaves and light waves are examples of electromagnetic waves. When electromagnetic waves strike an object, they may be transmitted through the object reflected off the object, or absorbed by the object. If a wave is absorbed, its energy is transferred to the object and the temperature of the object increases. In a typical heat exchanger, heat is transferred by conduction, convection, and radiation from one fluid to another. As a general rule, most heat transfer occurs by conduction and convection. To get a better understanding of how heat transfer occurs in a heat exchanger, we'll use this heat exchanger. It's called an air fin cooler, or a fin fan cooler. It's used to transfer heat from a process fluid to the air that flows through the cooler. The cooler consists of a series of tubes, each of which has thin metal fins. The heat exchanger also has a fan. During operation, the fluid being cooled passes through the tubes. The fluid transfers heat to the tubes by conduction and convection. Some of this heat is then transferred through the tubes and into the fins by conduction. From there, heat in the tubes and the fins is transferred by conduction and convection to the surrounding air. To increase the amount of heat transfer to the air, the fans in the cooler can be started. This increases the airflow through the cooler, which increases the amount of heat that is transferred by convection to the surrounding air. For example, as the difference in temperature between the two fluids in a heat exchanger increases, the amount of heat that can be transferred also increases. The amount of surface area in a heat exchanger is another factor that affects heat transfer. Basically, the greater the surface area, the greater the amount of heat transfer that can occur. Another factor that can affect heat transfer is the type of material that the heat is transferred through. Materials that are more dense are better at transferring heat and are normally used as conductors of heat. On the other hand, materials that are less dense will transfer less heat and are normally used as insulators. The flow rates of the fluids involved also affect the amount of heat that can be transferred. 
Generally, as the amount of fluid that passes through a heat exchanger increases, the amount of heat that can be transferred also increases. Heat transfer can also be affected by the presence of contaminants in the fluids. These contaminants, or impurities, can build up on a heat exchanger and form another layer of material that the heat must transfer through. This layer of material will act as an insulator, and the amount of heat that can be transferred in the heat exchanger will decrease. In this topic, we talked about heat and heat transfer, and we looked at how heat can be transferred by conduction, convection, and radiation. We also looked at how heat is transferred inside a heat exchanger, and we discussed factors that can affect heat transfer. Now let's try some practice questions on heat and heat transfer. The third form of heat transfer is radiation. Radiation is the transfer of energy by electromagnetic waves. Microwaves and light waves are examples of electromagnetic waves. During operation, the fluid being cooled passes through the tubes. The fluid transfers heat to the tubes by conduction and convection. Some of this heat is then transferred through the tubes and into the fins by conduction. From there, heat in the tubes and the fins is transferred by conduction and convection to the surrounding air. To increase the amount of heat transfer to the air, the fans in the cooler can be started. This increases the airflow through the cooler, which increases the amount of heat that is transferred by convection to the surrounding air. As an operator, you may be required to operate many types of heat exchangers. Since shell and tube heat exchangers are one of the most common types of heat exchangers, you need to be familiar with their components and operation. We'll use this illustration of a shell and tube heat exchanger to explain how it works. The main components include a shell, a group of tubes called a tube bundle, tube sheets, and heads. The shell is the casing of the heat exchanger. The area inside the shell and outside the tubes is commonly called the shell side of the heat exchanger. The shell also has an inlet and an outlet. The tubes are used to create a separate flow path through the shell. Each end of the tubes opens into a head. One head directs flow into the tubes, while the other head directs flow out of the tubes. The area inside the tubes and heads is called the tube side of the heat exchanger. The heads also contain a tube side inlet and outlet. The ends of the tubes are supported by the tube sheets. The tube sheets also isolate the heads from the shell side of the heat exchanger. The tubes are supported inside the shell by partitions called baffles. The baffles also direct flow through the shell side of the heat exchanger which helps increase the efficiency of the unit. Here's how this heat exchanger works. During operation, the cooler fluid enters the shell, flows around the tubes, and leaves through the shell outlet. On the tube side, the hotter fluid passes through the inlet head, through the tubes, into the outlet head, and leaves through the tube outlet. As the hotter fluid passes through the tubes, it transfers heat to the tubes and the fluid on the shell side, so the temperature of the fluid flowing through the tubes decreases. On the shell side, the cooler fluid passes around the tubes and receives heat from the tubes, so its temperature increases. This is a simplified illustration of a distillation system. The heat exchanger in this system is used to cool the processed liquid so that it can be stored safely. In this system, a distillation column is used to separate a product from a process liquid. The product boils off and leaves the top of the column. The remaining liquid is pumped from the bottom of the column. The hot liquid passes through the heat exchanger and transfers some of its heat to a coolant that flows through the shell side of the heat exchanger. The cooled process fluid is then sent to a tank where it's stored. In this system, the heat exchanger is used as a heater. The process liquid that's pumped through the heat exchanger tubes is heated by steam that flows through the shell side of the heat exchanger. The heated liquid is then sent to a process reactor. In the reactor, additional materials are mixed with the liquid and a chemical reaction occurs. By heating the process liquid, 
The heat exchanger enables the chemical reaction to take place more efficiently. In order to get fluids into and out of a heat exchanger and make sure that heat transfer occurs efficiently, some auxiliary components are needed. These auxiliary components include valves, instruments, and steam traps. There may be many different valves used with a heat exchanger. For example, isolation valves may be located on a heat exchanger's inlet and outlet. They're open to place the unit in operation and closed to isolate the unit when it's taken out of service. Many heat exchangers also have drain valves. These valves are used to remove fluid from the heat exchanger when the unit is shut down. Vent valves are also found on heat exchangers. Vent valves are used to remove air or other undesirable gases from heat exchangers. If pockets of air or gas are trapped inside the unit, they can prevent process fluids from coming into contact with some of the tubes. When this happens, the heat exchanger won't be able to transfer heat properly. These pockets reduce the heat exchanger's efficiency and can produce hot spots. A hot spot is an area in the heat exchanger where temperatures become excessive. These areas of high temperature can damage the heat exchanger. Another valve that's commonly found on a heat exchanger is a relief valve. Relief valves are used to prevent overpressurizing heat exchangers. If the pressure exceeds a preset limit, the relief valve opens to relieve the pressure. The relief valve will remain open until the pressure falls below the preset limit. Another type of valve that is commonly used with heat exchangers is a control valve. Control valves are used to regulate the flow of fluids through heat exchangers. For example, the flow of the heating or cooling fluid is often regulated to control the temperature of the process fluid leaving a heat exchanger. In this system, the control valve is linked through an instrument system to a device that senses the outlet temperature of the fluid. As the fluid's temperature changes, the sensing device sends a signal through a controller to the control valve actuator which opens or closes the control valve and regulates flow to maintain the desired temperature. Generally, an operator can observe instruments to determine if a heat exchanger is operating properly. These instruments are often located in the control room, but they may also be found on or near the heat exchanger. Depending on the heat exchanger and its use, pressure and temperature gauges may be placed on any or all of the heat exchanger's inlets and outlets. On heat exchangers that use steam, an auxiliary device called a steam trap is often used. The steam trap drains water, or condensate, from the steam in the heat exchanger without letting the steam escape. Lost steam reduces the efficiency of the heat exchanger. The basic function of all heat exchangers is to heat or cool fluids. But even though they all do the same basic job, they're often designed differently. For example, the shells and tubes of heat exchangers are often designed to create certain flow paths. These flow paths determine the number of times the fluids pass by each other and the direction or type of flow through the heat exchanger. This shell and tube heat exchanger can be described as a single pass unit. The fluid on the tube side enters one head and exits from the other head. The shell side fluid enters here, flows in the opposite direction, and exits here. The two fluids pass each other only once. This heat exchanger is designed so that the tube side fluid passes the shell side fluid twice. The tube side fluid enters here and is directed through half of the tubes by the inlet head. After passing through the first half of the tubes, the fluid is directed into the rest of the tubes by the return head. The fluid then passes through the rest of the tubes and is directed out of the heat exchanger. Besides the number of passes, the flow paths inside a heat exchanger can also be used to categorize types of heat exchangers. There are three general categories for the flow path through a heat exchanger. Parallel flow, cross flow, and counter flow. In a parallel flow heat exchanger, the shell side fluid and the tube side fluid move in the same direction. In this heat exchanger, the tube side fluid passes through the tubes in this direction, and the shell side fluid passes around the tubes in the same direction. In a cross-flow heat exchanger, 
the fluids flow perpendicular to each other. The tube side fluid enters through this inlet, flows through the tubes, and exits through this outlet. The shell side fluid enters the shell through this inlet, flows across the tubes, and leaves the shell through this outlet. In a counterflow heat exchanger, the fluids move through the shell and tubes in opposite directions. During operation, the tube side fluid enters this inlet, passes through the tubes, and leaves the unit through this outlet. On the other side of the heat exchanger, the shell side fluid enters this inlet, flows around the tubes, and leaves the unit through this outlet. With parallel flow heat exchangers, the temperature difference between the two fluids is greatest where the two fluids enter the heat exchanger. So the amount of heat transfer is greatest at this point. By the time the fluids are near the outlets, there is little or no temperature difference, so little or no heat is transferred. Counterflow is often the most efficient of the three types of flow because the temperature difference between the two fluids remains relatively constant as the fluids pass side by side. As a result, heat transfer between the fluids can take place the entire time that they're in the heat exchanger. When the temperature difference between the two fluids in a heat exchanger that uses cross flow is plotted on a graph, it appears to be very similar to the graph for a counterflow unit. Cross flow units are often used to condense process vapors. In this topic, we talked about shell and tube heat exchangers. We looked at the basic parts that make up this type of heat exchanger, and we described different ways that fluids can flow through them. Now let's try some practice questions that relate to this material. The tubes are used to create a separate flow path through the shell. Each end of the tubes opens into a head. One head directs flow into the tubes, while the other head directs flow out of the tubes. The area inside the tubes and heads is called the tube side of the heat exchanger. The heads also contain a tube side inlet and outlet. On heat exchangers that use steam, an auxiliary device called a steam trap is often used. The steam trap drains water or condensate from the steam in the heat exchanger without letting the steam escape. Lost steam reduces the efficiency of the heat exchanger. In a counterflow heat exchanger, the fluids move through the shell and tubes in opposite directions. During operation, the tube side fluid enters this inlet, passes through the tubes, and leaves the unit through this outlet. On the other side of the heat exchanger, the shell side fluid enters this inlet, flows around the tubes, and leaves the unit through this outlet. Like all other heat exchangers, a plate heat exchanger transfers heat from one fluid to another. This particular plate heat exchanger uses a series of thin metal plates placed back to back to transfer the heat. The plates are arranged so that hot fluid flows downward on one side of a plate and cold fluid flows upward on the opposite side of the plate. The heat is transferred from the hot fluid through the plate to the cooler fluid on the other side of the plate. To see how a plate heat exchanger works, we'll use this simplified illustration of a counterflow plate heat exchanger. If we look at a few of the individual plates, we can see that during operation, the hot fluid enters this inlet, flows through the portholes, and passes downward between the plates. The fluid then flows into the portholes at the bottom of the plates, where it's directed to the hot fluid outlet. The cold fluid enters the heat exchanger on the bottom, and passes through another set of portholes at the bottom of the plates. The cold fluid then flows upward on the opposite sides of the plates and exits the portholes at the top of the plates. From there, it's directed to the cold fluid outlet. Keep in mind that the plates are actually back to back, so the two fluids pass each other on opposite sides of a plate moving in opposite directions. All plate heat exchangers work basically the same way. So by looking at the components of a typical plate heat exchanger, you'll better understand how all plate heat exchangers work. This plate heat exchanger consists of a series of thin metal plates and two fixed end plates. The end plates are used to help support the other plates, and they hold the fluid inlets and outlets. 
The plates inside the heat exchanger have a corrugated or ridged surface. The ridges cause turbulence as the fluid passes over the plate. The turbulence helps increase the amount of heat that's transferred. The plate also has portholes. These portholes direct the flow of fluid between the plates. Near the portholes are flow directors that distribute the fluid evenly over the plates. Between each two plates is a gasket which separates the plates and creates a channel between them. The gaskets also seal the plates together so that the process fluids won't leak out of the heat exchanger. The gaskets also seal around the portholes so that the two fluids won't mix together and contaminate each other. In this topic, we focused on one type of heat exchanger commonly found in plants, a plate heat exchanger. We looked at the parts that make up a plate heat exchanger and we saw how the unit operates. Now let's try some practice questions that relate to the material. In this counterflow plate heat exchanger, the hot fluid enters through this port and exits through this port. With that in mind, select where the cold fluid enters the heat exchanger. If we look at a few of the individual plates, we can see that during operation, the hot fluid enters this inlet, flows through the portholes, and passes downward between the plates. The fluid then flows into the portholes at the bottom of the plates, where it's directed to the hot fluid outlet. The cold fluid enters the heat exchanger on the bottom and passes through another set of portholes at the bottom of the plates. The cold fluid then flows upward on the opposite sides of the plates and exits the portholes at the top of the plates. From there, it's directed to the cold fluid outlet. Keep in mind that the plates are actually back to back so the two fluids pass each other on opposite sides of a plate moving in opposite directions. This plate heat exchanger consists of a series of thin metal plates and two fixed end plates. The end plates are used to help support the other plates and they hold the fluid inlets and outlets. The plates inside the heat exchanger have a corrugated or ridged surface. The ridges cause turbulence as the fluid passes over the plate. The turbulence helps increase the amount of heat that's transferred. In this counterflow plate heat exchanger, the hotter fluid enters the unit here. Select the arrow to the port where the colder fluid enters the heat exchanger. In this counterflow plate heat exchanger, the cooler fluid enters here and flows upward. Select the arrow to the inlet for the hotter fluid. 